Good morning. Welcome to Biblical Soul Care Sunday School class this morning. I see a lot of new young faces in the room, so welcome to you all. Um, if you want to find your seat, we'll pray and get started. Our topic for the day is loving forbearance and why that's a prerequisite for us if we're going to be conflict resolvers and if we're going to do that to the glory of God, to do it God's way, uh, that's necessary for us. So let's go ahead and pray and then we'll jump in. Father, we do thank you for uh, another chance to get together this morning. Uh, it was so great to be here at Flint Hills Bible Church amongst other brothers and sisters in Christ who are seeking to uh, follow you and obey you. And Father, as we talk about conflict and how we are to resolve it biblically, I pray that you would teach us, that you would help us to be humble and to learn the ways in which we can help others and we can even um, identify attitudes and, and practices in our own lives where we are not resolving conflict in humility and gentleness and patience and loving forbearance. Father, would you be honored and glorified by the way that we talk this morning, the way that we listen, the way that we um, learn. We do this for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so this is the last, this is chapter four of our book. If you have not picked that up, there's still lots of copies out there, Resolving Conflict by Lou Priello. A very good book. Um, and right now we are finishing up the, the four prerequisites uh, that he identifies as necessary if we're going to resolve conflict biblically. Um, and he derives those from Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. It's there in your handout. By the way, if you did not get a handout, there hopefully are still some left by the door. <clears throat> and Paul writes this in Ephesians 4, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So humility, gentleness, patience, and loving forbearance are the four necessary traits that must be part of your character uh, if you're wanting to resolve conflict in, uh, in God's way. So just to reflect on what we've been through already, humility, just a real quick uh, definition would be the mindset of a servant. Uh, the humble person considers God and others as more important and more significant than himself or herself. Um, they seek the glory of God and the good of others in all things. That would be humility. Gentleness uh, is a kind of a godly restraint and of whatever power of your emotions, of your words, of all your intellect uh, to be used for the good of others and, and the glory of God to those righteous ends. It's a control. It's not lashing out um, in those ways, in those situations, particularly in, during conflict. Um, patience is enduring with a confident assurance of God's faithfulness, wisdom, and goodness in the midst of difficult, painful, or annoying circumstances. And that brings us to loving forbearance. So, um, following the pattern of the first three chapters, he gives multiple definitions uh, of each attribute, and then we're going to read through those and talk about them. And as in previous chapters, they don't all explicitly uh, um, influence biblical conflict resolution, but they are broader than that. So they are things that we should be seeking to apply to our hearts and lives. Um, and if these things are lacking, then biblical conflict resolution will not take place as it should. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at that first definition. Lupriola writes, Forbearance is the ability to recognize and appreciate the fact that God has made each person different. And that seems pretty obvious, but let's go ahead and read that uh, verse right there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
uh, verses 14 through 20. I'll give you a second to turn there. While you're doing that, I'll read that definition again. Forbearance is the ability to recognize and appreciate the fact that God has made each person different. First Corinthians 12, starting in verse 14, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the, be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So, if you think about the different parts and how everybody's different, how can forbearance, according to this definition, be helpful in resolving conflict? For the new ones, I'm very good at waiting and enjoying awkward silence. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> so, I will wait. What do you think? How, how does that definition help us in resolving conflict? Right. We know that we're different. We know there's going to be differences of opinion. That helps us to just expect there to be some conflict. It will prevent us, hopefully, from just assuming that everybody's going to agree with me. Right? And if they don't, then they're wrong. Okay. But God has made all of us different. We have different points of view, different perspectives. Okay. Does that mean all points of view and perspectives are correct and true? No, it does not. But does any one person have the, uh, all of their opinions correct? No. So we all have areas where we're a little off in our uh, opinions or our theology even, in our interpretation of Scripture. And the longer that we live, we, hopefully, the, the desire is that we, as we look at Scripture, we allow Scripture to inform and change our opinions. Um, so there is an authority, though. It's just not me. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that? Just the, the little summary there. Having wisdom to know that and recognize that God makes people with different perspectives and opinions can help us to expect disagreements in our relationships. Uh, this is something that we can and should be thankful for because God, in his divine wisdom and sovereignty, does all things well, and he creates different people with different perspectives. Page two, the second definition is, forbearance is the ability to distinguish sin issues from non-sin issues. Whew, this is going to be there's some opportunities here for some interesting discussion. So let's read, before we do that, that scenario, James chapter 4, if you turn there. Verses 11 and this, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? 
Let's look at this scenario. <clears throat> Kevin and Dinah. They're a married couple in their 50s, and their local church is seeing an influx of new college students and young married couples. As leaders in the church, Kevin and Dinah are involved in engaging these new newcomers and welcoming them into the church. They have noticed several trends in the young people, including visible tattoos, very casual or questionable clothing. They talk of drinking beer, and some even have the nerve to question the music selections during congregational singing. Which of these issues are sinful behaviors and attitudes that Kevin and Dinah need to address with the newcomers? And how should they go about having these conversations? Yeah, so just talking about the drinking could be one, um, and then also the questionable clothing could be one. Okay, so if we do those two, how, should, how would you go about addressing your concerns with them? As you're thinking through how you might do that, the, the key here, and what makes this so difficult is any one of those things, there might, it might raise concerns. What our job to do as uh, Bible-believing and, and Bible-following believers is when we go to these people uh, to figure out if that is a sin and if it is. Because any one of these things could be sinful. There could be sinful attitudes with which you critique the songs of a, of a church but they also could be not sinful. There could be ways in which they're doing things in the freedom that Christ has given them, and it is not crossing that line into sin. And if we go and take something that is not a sin issue and initiate conflict, telling them that this is a sin issue, we are no longer biblically resolving conflict. In fact, we might be creating conflict when there was no need for it. So the two that Joe just brought up, we've got, let's deal with the clothing first. When would clothing cross the line into a sinful area? If, if they're not appropriately dressed, right? There we've got um, immodest clothing, boys or girls, whatever that might be. There, it might be immodest, drawing attention to themselves in, in a way that would be uh, sinful. That could be definitely an issue that would need to be addressed. Okay. When would it not be an issue that you would need to address? And you might just be called to forbear with them in a loving manner and not jump on it. So we might need to talk about, we might need to think and reflect on our own ideas of modesty and what that means and what um, is necessary to be modest, right? Uh, and even when you think about somebody coming into church who coming in shirt, like shirt, the t-shirt and shorts, does that bother some people? Is that a sin issue? No. So as we go and, and address some of these things, there are ways in which the, the dress could signal sinful behavior, sinful patterns of life, and it could just be they don't know. Maybe it's a person who uh, is having a crisis in their life, and, they're see and they just come to church in a t-shirt and shorts and some flip-flops. And if we jump on that and be like, hey, you really should be respecting the house of God, and you had better not wear that stuff in this church. What have we just done? We probably harmed them. Maybe they don't come back again. 
And so, and even in, I remember uh, Pastor Dave in a sermon several months ago, maybe in a year, I don't know, talked about how, what if a young man or a young lady comes in dressed immodestly, but that's all they had, and they were seeking, again, seeking um, help, seeking spiritual guidance, and we jump on them because they're not modestly dressed. I think part of forbearance is the decision to not assume the worst intentions and the worst motivations of every person that you meet. If it is possible, with a lack of evidence that they are trying to do something sinful, we should give them the benefit of the doubt. We do need to eventually talk to them about those things that are potentially sinful in their lives, but the question that we are coming to is, how do they go about that? How do, should we go about addressing that issue? What context should we do that in? Do you do that on the Sunday morning? Probably not. The forbearance is having patience on that Sunday morning coming alongside them and say, hey, would you like to come to lunch with me? And, and I'd love to talk to you about your testimony or about what, why you're here. What are you, what are you looking for? What do you, you know, what do you think? What did you think of the service? And beginning a relationship in which you can lovingly and patiently and with forbearance help them along. What about the beer? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so then we become, you know, as I say, more guard to the law, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah. So Heather and Joe bringing up the, I think the couple of really important things. Number one, you, you ask questions. You go in asking questions truly uh, with a humble attitude, not presuming to know their heart, okay? Uh, but Heather brings up all the, also, if they're, you know, a young college student and they're talking about drinking beer and they're not maybe old enough to drink beer, that becomes a sin issue. That is unlawful activity. But how do you discover those things? And the way that we go about addressing it is important. Showing loving forbearance and not just saying, you sinner, how dare you? Now, could there be sinful attitudes even if, so let, thinking of alcohol, Joe says, uh, and he's right, it, drinking alcohol in itself is not wrong but drunkenness would be, right? Or can you have sinful attitudes and sinful um, behavior if you're drinking one beer or one glass of wine, insert the whatever type of alcohol, if there, there could be an issue in their heart and they're thinking about alcohol, that could be sinful. But again, also like Joe said was, we have to ask questions. We have to engage them with a humble and loving attitude, lovingly forbearing with them to see what is there. What's there in their heart? What attitudes? So the key is not to judge our brothers by unbiblical standards or to judge them judge sin too quickly before we actually know. And you can go through each of those things. If, we, if you talk, There is a way to sinfully critique, critique, like I said earlier, critique the music choices. Okay? There is a way um, to flaunt your freedoms in Christ so that it does not, it, now it's crossing over and it's becoming ungodly, sinful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
she was talking about our motives when we go to them as the, the mentor. Do I have a personal problem with tattoos, for example? And that's why I'm going to go talk to people about how you need to go get that removed or you need to wear some clothing that covers that up or whatever the case may be. That would be my own standard at times, and we, and we all have different, we'll go to some different uh, definitions here. We, ha- we all have these different beliefs and opinions about things that we have to be very careful not to elevate those to the same level and authority as Scripture. If we do that, we are sinning. Number three, we've kind of addressed this a little bit, but would it ever become necessary to address the non-sin issues that Kevin and Dinah are seeing in newcomers? One that's kind of benign, it would be like the clothing. Let's say that they're just wearing shorts and a t-shirt to church all the time. Would that be something that we would need to address with them? Yeah, in the context of a discipleship relationship for their um, growth in holiness and godliness, we might bring it up. What if it's just their conviction that they just, I want to be comfortable in church so that I can focus on the word. Loving forbearance would suggest that we, okay, praise the Lord. (laughs) And they're sitting there with uh, shorts and a t-shirt. But like Russell's saying, you, you ask questions to see why they're doing some certain things. Because if there is a sinful attitude that under, underlies those things, we want to, we should want to lovingly help them to grow in holiness, to grow in godliness, even in the way that we dress. Any other thoughts before we move on? All right, let's see the next uh, letter C there, the next definition. Forbearance is the willingness to allow others the freedom to develop and express their own unique lifestyles within the framework of Scripture without passing judgment on them or holding them in contempt. Let's look at Romans chapter 14. Verses 1 through 6. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to the Lord, or thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord, and gives thanks to God. Okay, another scenario here. Benny and Leslie, and if you're, by the way, if your name is in these, I apologize. My wife and I go through about a dozen names every time we try to do these things, because I'm like, no, there is one of those. Okay, so Benny and Leslie, we try. But they're parents of three young children who go to the neighborhood public school. Danny and Melody have four children who are all homeschooled. And Bobby and Allie have them both beat with six children who all attend the private Christian school in town. 
Danny and Melody recently heard a sermon online in which the pastor describes public schools as indoctrination centers that no Christian family should take part in. Imagine the conversation that takes place the next Sunday when these three couples are discussing education choices. How might each couple be tempted to judge or to hold the others in contempt? And how should they show loving forbearance to one another? Let's start with Benny and Leslie, and they go to the public school. What might be the temptations for them to judge or hold in contempt? Mm-hmm. So yeah, th- there's, there's going to be a matter of opinion in some of these things, and there's going to be a, a wide range of different calibers of schools and different um, levels of you might what, what they would say indoctrination, right? So some schools, absolutely, I may not want to send my children to that public school. Other public schools might be a lot better. Uh, so there, there is differences. So for, for Ben and Leslie, who, who are taking their uh, children to the, sending their children to the public school, is that sinful? No. Okay, there, it may be, uh, depending on the conviction of Benny and Leslie, um, it might be good for those kids to, get, to go through. And like um, some students, uh, some kids, some families have some kids that go to public school, some kids that are homeschooled, and have all kinds of different things. And it, sometimes it depends on the particular um, strengths and gifts of that child and the needs of that child to where you might want to send them in different places, to educate them in different places. We need to be careful, too, about the implication that homeschool is some sort of socialism for unbelievers. Mm-hmm. That, isn't, that isn't true. Heather brings up a good point. So it's... The, there's this kind of assumption that if I homeschool them, they're Christians. They're going to get it. I mean, they can't not. It'll rub off on them, okay? But that does not mean that they're going to be believers. It does not mean that they're not going to be susceptible once they leave you to the indoctrination of whatever other organization they become a part of. And I think sometimes, like, we don't, I mean, we don't have all the details here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so think of the damage that you might do in saying, so you, you just are okay with your kid being indoctrinated then, huh? You're just okay with them going to the public school and just loving godless behavior and learning all, like, maybe they both work and they can't do the, the homeschooling. Maybe they can't afford the pri- private school. There's, there are things that we must be careful of. Maybe the public school is not as bad as you think it is. We read a couple of articles just this weekend about how a lot of these, some Christian private schools are embracing unbiblical ideas like critical race theory. It's being just brought into the Christian schools. Okay, so that just like um, someone just mentioned, it, just like homeschooling is not an automatic thing, your Christian private school may not be an automatic safeguard against some of those unbiblical ideas and practices. Yeah, Ruth, you had something? So loving forbearance would demand that we afford them the benefit of the doubt, that they are loving their kids, that they are giving it a lot of thought to their educational choice, and that they have come to the conclusion, based on their opinions, that this place, wherever they decide to go, is the right place to educate their children. And and we afford that. That's loving forbearance. We've got to afford one another that benefit, and then we engage. Sometimes we may need to engage and talk through those things and ask questions in a loving and humble way to find out. Maybe, maybe they just don't know. Okay. Any other thoughts? Well, we shouldn't be afraid of these conversations. I mean, if you want to fix your public school, well, you've got to fix your great school. Or if mm-hmm. God, God is trying to, you should be able to talk about Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Does it does it give you anxiety to talk about it right now? If we were to to end this class early and you had just mingling and you're talking to other people who are who did different things, does that give you anxiety? Does that make you angry to think about the the possible conversations that would happen? Loving forbearance is rejecting that, repenting of that, and having an open conversation. And we'll, we'll discover and we'll read about it in a little bit. Being open that maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe I have a, a, an opinion that is wrong. And, that, and Lindsay's talking about how we, we, there's such a strong temptation to defend our opinions and elevate those opinions um, like the Pharisees do in Scripture uh, in the New Testament. 
and we have to. That's why there's four um, prerequisites. Humility is part of those things, and being willing to acknowledge that, that God gives wisdom to different people, and I might be wrong on this, and to not just justify my choices, and if somebody questions it, I'm going to get angry. If somebody disagrees with me, then they can't be my friend, really. I mean, they're not really on the same page as me. It would be hard for us to... No, no, that's... Those are all instances where we're not being lovingly forbearing one, with one another, not being humble, not being gentle and patient. It's necessary to separate my opinions uh, about schooling or about parenting. This happens up a lot with parenting. And do you discipline this way or do you not discipline this way? Do, do you have a, a strict schedule? Do you not have a strict schedule? Do you? There's there's a thousand things. Do you read the ESV or do you read the NIV? Like, well, this is going to determine how good friends. Are. You know, those there's are there are a thousand different instances where we have to be forbearing with one another. We have to assume and not be defensive when questioned and to not seek to question others just to make them change their mind. It's a, trying to attack their point of view and get them on your side. But the loving forbearance is, is the attitude of love and the desire to help them grow in godliness and holiness and Christ-likeness. Yeah, I love that Paul is saying, if, the guy, if he wants to eat vegetables only, let him eat vegetables. It's great. He's thankful for the, to, for the Lord to eat vegetables. And that guy's eating a steak. If he's thankful to the Lord and he's giving praise to God for the steak, praise God, either one, it's okay. He doesn't say, eventually he'll come around. Right? <laughs> you know, just be patient and you'll get, you just serve him, you know, sneak some meat into his salad and then just... That is not what he's doing. It's okay that he, he eats vegetables. It's okay that he seems one day as more special than the other days. He's giving praise and thanks to God, and that's okay. And he's, he's leaving it there. I like that. That's what we, we've got to remember that. I don't have to make everybody agree with me. feeling judged by the vegetarian or the vegetarian or maybe you know and it's silly because now what they're going to focus off of christ and the gospel and mm-hmm. so. yeah yeah that's good any other comments before we move on 
All right, let's go ahead and move on. So we need to go through, uh, here's the bottom line, top of page three, bottom line for both. Um, and this is something that Lou Priola says uh, in, in the book on page 96. He's got a lot of uh, parentheses in there, but he says, here's the bottom line for both. Don't you dare presume to judge another's actions or opinions without the authorization of Scripture. Okay, then on page 97, putting this all together, to be forbearing is to put up with, not to judge uncharitably or hold in contempt, the lawful lifestyles of other believers remembering that God has accepted them. All right. So, forbearance, letter D, this is the next definition. Forbearance is the ability in close relationships to distinguish swing issues from fire issues. And this is, this is kind of interesting. So if you haven't read this, that's probably not going to make any sense. So um, I'll read you his kind of explanation. A swing issue is a matter not involving sin in which I can easily go both ways. The person with whom I am in conflict may prefer to go in one direction while I prefer to go in another, but because I am a forbearing person, I will swing with it. If it means that much to you, I am willing to yield my personal desires to yours in order to prefer you in honor and pursue peace with you. Whereas a fire issue is an issue that, although not necessarily a sin, again, not necessarily a sin, would be very difficult for me to agree to do. Perhaps it's a matter of personal preference or taste or enjoyment, but for whatever reason, I find the matter objectionable. Okay, so forbearance is, let me read the definition again, the ability in close relationships to distinguish between swing issues where I don't have an incredibly strong preference either way, but I, I do have a preference, but I'm willing to, in forbearance, to go with your preference. Versus the fire issue, where that would be like, I have a strong pushback on that. I don't like that. So how do you, can you distinguish between the two in close relationships? And so here's some possible fire issues. Now, notice, um, as I was we were talking through this with my wife. We were thinking, well, any of these things can be either swing or fire issues for different people. So you have to be kind of careful. I, I put some on fire and I put some on the uh, swing and you might go back and forth. So I probably should have just said issues. <laughs> but possible fire issues, um, not missing church for sports or other events. It'd be one where I have a strong conviction that Attendance on Sunday mornings is very important, and so it would take a lot for me to miss that. That could be a fire issue. Okay, um, Not watching movies with questionable content. Maybe it's a war movie. It's got some language in it, and there's some, some violence in there, and you're like, oh, I don't like that. That might be a fire issue for you. Whereas others, like, they have that, I- that issue is they need, they, not they don't need, they, they do watch those types of movies. Um, supporting organizations like the NCAA, NFL, in the NBA, or the M, uh, Major League Baseball, MLB, I guess I forgot that one, um, or businesses like Coca-Cola, Target, or whatever, because of their support or their um, propping up of, of unbiblical or ungodly groups, organizations, or ideas. So for some, that might be, I will not go to another NFL game if they're going to kneel for the flag. And that might be a fire issue for you. Other issues, swing issues perhaps, shopping locally here in Emporia versus getting it on Amazon Prime. Because like, I like the idea of shopping locally, but it's really convenient to get to just order it on Amazon. So that might be a swing issue. I'm trying to do the shop local, support local businesses, you know, because I love Emporia. But could I be persuaded to do the other? Letting kids stay up late. So there's all kinds of different, for you and for me to, to reflect on our, why something is a fire issue versus a, a swing issue and being able to make loving, forbearing decisions in those relationships with those topics. 
I have a big problem with the NFL and somebody invites me over to their house to watch the game. Or the MLB, because it's baseball season right now. And I have a big problem with that. How are you going to distinguish between those two? Is that a fire issue or a swing issue? Do I need to lovingly choose to come and have fellowship? Even though it's something that I don't necessarily like. Do I go and buy delicious vanilla Coke, even though they might be supporting something that I don't like, I think is destructive to the culture, to, um, to humanity. <laughs> yes, there are certain things that we have to weigh and to not, again, not assume and judge that other people are for those things if they patronize that group or if they, that business. Okay, so the interest of time, let's go to the next one. Forbearance is the ability to put up with idiosyncratic swing issues that you wish were different in another person and to sacrifice your own desires for his benefit. So these are those, those things, those personality differences, those um, habits, quirks that we all have that don't mesh with one another. So the loving, forbearing thing to do is to put up with those things and not just kind of write them off. I'm like, man, that, that person's weird. I don't like talking with that person. Or maybe they think I'm weird. I, whatever the case is, uh, is to, I'm, I'm just going to avoid them unless they change. Okay, that, that would be where you go to that person and you put up with it in a loving way. It's not like, and they shouldn't be able to tell that you're just putting up with them. <laughs> that kind of defeats the purpose as well. So you lovingly forbear with those habits that they might have, those quirks, because they're doing the same for you, and you love them as a brother or sister in Christ. You encourage them. Okay. We have... How do we interact? How can we interact with those who have very different personalities and interests and opinions than we do? How can we do that in a way that, is, that shows loving forbearance? Can you probably just tell from my example that I like sports? If you don't like sports, how can we interact and, and love one another, encourage one another? Yeah, I, I don't insist on talking about sports with that person. We talk about what we have in common, which is faith in Christ. Yeah. The sermon that we heard on Sunday. Maybe something work-related that we do have in common that we can encourage one another in. And we've kind of talked about this with the, the school and the educational choices. How, how do I interact with a, another family who does not make the same educational choices, and, we've, and several people around the room have talked about, well, you uh, assume the best intentions for them. You don't assume that you know all that happens in their school. You don't make those choices. You don't get defensive if they ask you a question about your choice. I'm not asking pointed questions to try and cause them to feel bad about their choice. Not making them defend their themselves and their their choices. Talking and, and loving them, seeking um, to be encouraged by them, to encourage them, not to hold my opinions or my views up on the level of scripture. Letter F, forbearance is the ability to respond lovingly to the immaturity of others without lowering yourselves, lowering ourselves to their standard of immaturity. So, for example, 
Edgar is a young man who has come to you for mentorship. You can, you can ladies, you can, Edna, maybe, for ladies. He's very young, Christian, and tends to complain a lot about his family, his friends, his job, his classes, his schedule, everything. What might, be a bad, what might a bad counselor do in advising Edgar or mentoring him? Or what would it look like to not show loving forbearance with Edgar? I think there's probably two ways you can, you can do this. When we talk about sinking to their level of maturity, you can do that. Or you can show the opposite of forbearance and just make demands on them. What might those, those look like? How might we, as more mature believers, sink down to their level? Complain with them. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. I have the same things. My family, oh, they do that too. I, my job, I can't believe my boss did the X, Y, and Z. We we would be lowering ourselves to their level of maturity. What else? Uh, maybe I don't complain with them, but I say, oh, you know what? You do have it pretty rough, man. You poor guy. Lower, it, affirming him and just telling you, oh, you, you have a right to complain about all that stuff. That would be also hindering his growth and maturity, right? If I just continue to let him wallow there. Okay, let's go to the other side. If I listen to this, this guy complaining to me, how could I be overly harsh? What might that look like? Stop it. You big baby. Look at this. Do everything without grumbling and complaining. What's wrong with you? We could, and we might not say it that strongly, but we could have that, that kind of, and sometimes, you know, sometimes in some cases, you might need to give them a little, little kick, a little kick in the pants, but... Um, I've received a few of those, so I, and I needed it, so I, I, that's how I know that part. So there are cer certain ways that we can be overly harsh, overly demanding. I don't want to hear you say another thing about that again. You need to toughen up. Those could be harmful. It could damage the relationship. You could cause them to not want to come to back and talk to you ever again. Or he might go into hiding and hide other certain sins. He goes, man... I, I'm complaining, and that he just smacked me around, and now I'm, I'm going to hide other things, and that could, I've now contributed to hindering his growth and holiness because I was overly harsh. Top of page four, we have a comment from Lou Priel. It says, biblically tolerant people accept the fact that others are immature, but rather than censure their immature brethren or accept their immaturity as satisfactory, they lovingly and prayerfully try to offer them a hand to encourage spiritual growth even in the midst of conflict. So lovingly, prayerfully, gently helping them to see and you might bring up that, that verse in Philippians. Do everything without complaining arguing. We use that one a lot at my house. Okay, so we, we do use that, but it, the way in which you use that is important. Uh, 
but a G. Let's a few minutes here. Forbearance is the ability to demonstrate biblical love to other believers even when they are struggling with sin. Let's look at Romans 15, 1. Go through three here. It says, we are, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So this is one that we have to be real clear about because there is a sense in which that we might see some sinful behaviors or some sinful attitudes, some sinful patterns where we don't jump on it right away. Some, uh, Lou Priolo gives a couple of examples why you may, uh, you may do that if the, the person is a new believer and there's a lot of work that they need to do. There's a lot of growth that needs to take place. And if I jump on every single sin issue, they're going to be discouraged. So uh, loving forbearance requires me to walk with them and to be gentle with them and to choose the issues that, uh, that we're going to address. And over time, <laughs> we have uh, opportunities to discuss those things, but I do not just hammer them for everything that they say or do that is sinful. Another example he gives is if it's somebody who is overcoming a years of life dominating, <clears throat> dominating sin, um, when I know that my children are convinced, convicted of their sins and are really working hard to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in getting them under control, I put up with those residues of lingering sin that still seem to be too much in control of their lives. So in some situations, if I have a person who struggles with complaining, do I address it every time I hear them complaining? If they have, we've had lots of discussions, they are repentant, they are um, praying for strength, we're doing things to address their complaining, the next day if they complain, sometimes I just... I let it go because I know the Lord is working and I know that, that we've had conversations and I know that he is repentant and or she wants to glorify and honor God with her words or his words. We are forbearing in those ways. Knowing all along that at some point we are going to need to, if we love this person, we're going to need to address that sinful issue because the sin is affecting their walk with the Lord. So loving re re forbearance is a, is a refusal to write off another person as a lost cause. It is walking with another brother or sister in Christ despite differences in personality, politics, and minor doctrinal issues. It's the willingness to come alongside another person and walk through life with a loving desire to see them grow. We are out of time, but there's a list of certain things there that, that Lou Priolo writes in his book um, that will help us. If you notice that you're lacking in loving forbearance, read those things. Uh, go to that, that section of the book. It's on page uh, 105 is where it begins. There's really helpful things to think through and pray through to help us develop uh, the habit of loving forbearance. So with that, we will end, and we will see you all next week. Have a blessed Sunday.
Good morning and welcome to Flint Hills Bible Church. I'd like to invite you to find your seats. Stand with us if you're able and join us together as we sing, O oh God, our help in ages past, the sovereignty and the eternality of our God. Let's sing. and welcome to Flint Hills Bible Church. Nice, bright, sunshiny day compared to some lately. Uh, still a little cool out here. We got more coming. But we're certainly glad you're here with us today and can enjoy worshiping with us, whether you're here locally or over the internet. Today for our scripture reading, we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 1, and we'll read the last half of that beginning in verse 15. So Colossians 1, 15 and following. Speaking of Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, 
All things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God, bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of his glory and of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words that paint for us a clear picture of Christ, Christ preeminent. Lord, we are completely indebted to you for our salvation as we hear in these words. So Lord, today we come together to worship you. We pray you will inhabit our worship as we continue through song and through the preaching of your word and through fellowship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand once again with us if you're able. Let's sing together of the indestructible nature of the church of Christ. We know that no matter what happens in our culture, that the Lord will build his church. So let's stand and sing, facing a task unfinished.
admission that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the son of the living God. Jesus tells Peter in Matthew 16, he says, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. While Jesus used Peter to build his church, it was built upon the foundation of Jesus' person and work on the cross. Jesus encourages us so that the uh, encourages us that the gates of hell will not be able to stop us while we finish the task of evangelism. Because Jesus himself, the solid rock, is building his church. So let's praise the Lord together for this solid rock of Jesus Christ.
that we might be able to be reconciled from sin and slavery to sin to slavery to worship the one and true and living God. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to um, show our reverence to you and show our worship to you this morning through singing your, your praises with the angels, as the song said, and that we might uh, hear your word preached in the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would move in each, each of our hearts, that we might be conformed to the image of Christ for his glory. We thank you for this time, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I want to welcome you again to Flint Hills Bible Church. Uh, it's time for our uh, communion, and this is the part of our service where we uh, celebrate what Christ has done for us. A communion is open to all who place their faith in the sacrificial work of Jesus on the cross as full payment for their sin. The elements are stationed at four different tables, one in each corner of the room. Uh, we recommend that you take a moment of remembrance and heart examination 
And then when you're ready, go to one of the tables, take the bread and the cup. Um, and although we take communion together here, uh, we don't take it in unison. So you take it when you're ready, and then you can discard the cups in the little basket there, or there's a receptacle in the chair in front of you. Um, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in chapter 2 this morning. And as you turn there, for our meditation, I want to ask a question. And that question is, do you fear death? If you were to ask the average Emporian uh, that same question, you'll, you might get a, several different answers. But I think in general, people will do everything they can to avoid talking about death. Uh, they want to avoid thinking about death, let alone talking about it. So the question is why? We all kind of know that death is not something to be enjoyed. So it's necessary then to consider what, what does Scripture say about how we are to view death. The reality is that human beings should fear death. It should terrify us. It should terrify people because the Bible says that death is the wages of sin. We also read in, in texts like Hebrews 9.27 that it is appointed for all men to die and then comes the judgment. Death is final. There's no coming back. There's no changing anything. There's no making a new decision. Once you die... Your eternal fate is sealed. And we are all deserving of the wrath of God for the sins that we have committed. But what about Christians? If you, when I read that opening statement, if you've placed your faith in the sacrificial work of Jesus on the cross as full payment for your sin, how should we feel about death? How should we view it? Let's look at our text this morning. It's in chapter 2 of Hebrews. We're going to read verses 14 through 17. The author writes this. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Christ, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it's not the angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So notice in that text that Jesus came and he took on flesh and blood and he did that because his mission was to come and die he experienced death but because he was sinless his death was the weapon that destroyed the devil it destroyed the power of death the slavery that we all have as human beings to fear of death has been destroyed because of Christ. The wrath of God that was stored up for you and I, in Christ, those wages have been paid. Jesus took them. So as we take this cup of juice and, and this little cracker this morning, remember that we're no longer slaves to the fear of death. The devil and his weapon of that power that he has over humanity has been destroyed by the death of our Savior. Remember that we are now children of God. And we are fellow heirs with Christ. Let's pray. Father, for those of us in the room who are not in Christ, I pray that the fear of death would be felt by them. 
that they could not, would not be able to ignore it. I pray that it would drive them to Christ. Lord, I pray that you would draw them to, the, to yourself and would have them throw themselves on the mercy of God, found only in Christ. And Father, for those of us who have placed our faith in Christ alone for the full payment of all the sins that we've committed, I pray that we would rejoice that your wrath is no longer on us, that Christ has satisfied the wrath of God that was over us. We thank you for the free gift of his righteousness that is ours only through faith. And we celebrate this morning. We praise you for your mercy, for your justice, for your righteousness, that in Christ we are made righteous. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As a continuation of our communion, uh, let's sing together as you're seated. Let's sing together. There is a fountain filled with gold.
it's now time to uh, we talk about offering. Uh, so we have different ways to give. There's a basket back there in the back of the room. Um, if you'd like to give that way, there's an app. And through our website, you can give online. You can mail the check or money into the church office or drop it by. So lots of different ways. Uh, let's pray for the offering this morning. Father, we do thank you uh, for the tremendous uh, riches that you've blessed us with. Um, not only in the possessions and the money, but in the, the time and the talents that you've given. We pray that you would help us to steward those because they are all yours. Everything we have comes from you, and we pray that we would celebrate and praise you by giving that back. We love you, Lord. We pray for wisdom as we decide, as the elders and the leadership decides how to spend that money to proclaim the gospel and to build your kingdom. We love you, Lord, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, once again, welcome to Flint Hills Bible Church this morning, and if uh, you are visiting with us, we certainly want to offer you a special welcome, and we have a gift for you out at the welcome table where you came in, so if you want to drop by there, you can pick that up. We'd like to see you do that. If you have any questions about us as a church, you can certainly inquire there. They will get you directed to the right answers. By the way, if you're with us online and you would like to know more about us, you can certainly contact our church office and accomplish the same thing. In your bulletin is an attendance and prayer form. We'd appreciate if you'd fill that out. And if you have a prayer request, put it down. There are people ready to pray with you over it. If you have a praise to mention, that's very welcome as well. You can drop those items and any other unwanted paper items in the baskets on the way out. We'll sort those out and put them in the right places. Have a few announcements. Women equipping women. This Friday, the 23rd, meal begins at 6. Andrea Heck will be speaking on how much have you been forgiven. Uh, that comes from Luke 7, uh, verses 36 to 50. So if you haven't signed up yet, please do so at the table in the foyer. By the way, Iron Men, our turn's May 7th. You can sign up as well. The Colston Farewell will be April 30th from 6 to 9. That's going to be at the Hoff home. The address is in the bulletin. It's a come and go evening. We're going to send the Colstons off with our blessings in a new ministry at North Lake Church in Smith Mill, Missouri. Hot dogs and s'mores will be provided. Please, please bring a side dish to share and lawn chairs. Uh, there's also a gift being put together from the church. If you stop by the information desk, you can write a note for the Colston family as we send them off. And uh, applications for parent dedication are due next Sunday. The applications are found by the sign-up sheet at the Information Center once again at the welcome desk. You can turn in your application by emailing the church office or at the information desk. And of course, as always, there's a number of things in the bulletin that I didn't mention, so be sure to look there. And with that, the four and five years old five-year-olds are dismissed to go to the foyer. They'll meet with their teachers there and they will escort them to the other building. And kindergarten through fourth grade are also dismissed to their classes. As we stand together and sing, I want to focus on a couple of words from this song. But though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler. And let's sing together. This is my father's world. Yeah. 
Well, good morning. Well, we're going to continue on our study of 2 Timothy, and last week I kind of concluded with the, uh, the statement that one generation builds it, another one enjoys it, and the third one destroys it, and even hinted that sometimes you have third generation thinking that can take place in a church like ours, which I, I think is present to, to some extent. Now, the reason why I'm preaching through 2 Timothy is we don't have to be third generation. All of us can make a decision to be first generation thinkers. So one of the slogans I've kind of come up with is be a builder, right? Be a builder. And so hopefully this message will help us along that course. So let's pray. Well, Father, we are just grateful today for your word and just the clarity uh, that comes from it. I pray that as we read this letter together, as we sit in on these final words from Paul to, to Timothy, that we will do so understanding that through the centuries that this word, through your Holy Spirit, is to be spoken to us. I pray that we will understand that of all the places to be, of all the messages to hear, you have this one for us at this time for your purposes and reasons. So, Lord, we sit under your teaching. Help us to do so gratefully, humbly, and with wisdom. In Christ's name, amen. Well, the two greatest minds of the 17th century, scientific minds of the 17th century, uh, were one, a, a man by the name of Robert Hooks. You may not have heard of him, but he was a big deal at the time. He was the first to actually visualize a microorganism by using a microscope. Now, his other rival, if you will, and they actually became rivals later on, was, was Isaac Newton. They both had an awareness of each other and the scientific genius and resources that the other brought. And earlier on, Isaac reached out to Hooks in a letter suggesting some mutual collaboration, that the scientific community would benefit if they worked together. And he wrote these famous words. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Right? If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulder, shoulders of giants. Right? He had a humble appreciation for all those scientists who came before. He realized that his discoveries were actually built on other discoverers. And, and really, that's the way all of this is. I mean, none of us really starts from scratch, right? We all have learned from other people. Every institution is built on the sacrifice and service of people who've gone before them, like the military, uh, universities. I mean, the government was built upon our founding fathers who really borrowed some Greek thought and classical thinking to generate those ideas. This church was built on the backs of other people who have gone before us. In fact, I'm not sure if we have an original member in this room right now, right? We stand on the shoulders of giants. And, and so the question is, how do you regard those who came before? Well, to give away the answer, it's with humble appreciation. But sadly, it's become quite fashionable in our day and age to despise our heritage. Uh, take, for instance, the, the 1619 Project. It's a historical act of revisionism, kind of perpetuated by the New York Times, where they postulate a thesis that the United States of America was built on the backs of slavery, and they single out 19, or 1619 because that was a year when the first African slaves set foot on American soil. So it's an attempt to really rewrite history, uh, bringing forth the worst motivations from our founders. I read another instance today where there's a real popular fad of, of former Christians denouncing their faith on social media platforms. And the New York Times actually ran a story about Abraham Piper. He is the son of of John Piper. You may know him, one of the most formative theologians out there, someone who's very, very influential in my thinking, in my life. And this is what the article said. 
I quote, Abraham Piper became a sensation on TikTok. That's a social media platform for you other people out there. I never use it, but some people do. Became a sensation on TikTok nearly overnight. He posted his first viral video in November, and he now has more than 900,000 followers. Many of them young people who thank him for capturing their experiences so precisely. His unlikely path to online stardom is this, irreverent critiques of evangelical Christianity aimed at others who have left the faith. So like his father, Abraham Piper learned about the power of words, right? He knows how to spin a phrase. He knows how to communicate. Many of that from growing up in the household of one of the most famous preachers of America. And he uses all those skills that he learned from his father to trash his heritage. He's standing on the shoulders of a giant and he's using a club to bash the brains of the giant beneath him. I think part of the reason why it's so fashionable to trash our heritage is we live in this day and age of hyper-individualism and expressionism, right? Where we don't want to be confined by anything, not even your history, not uh, your family legacy. And the heritage is just one more thing that people might feel like they need to perpetuate that might rob them of individual freedom and choice. And so instead of doing the work of perpetuating their heritage, they despise it to excuse themselves from having any responsibility to do so. But for a church to grow and to be built, uh, its design is to be built on the backs of previous generations. That's why when we read scripture, we often see a building analogy when it comes to the church, especially when, when Paul speaks about building the church. In 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 11, Paul says, according to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, someone else is building upon it, and let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So the idea is you have the foundation of Jesus and then people are building upon that foundation. It's like a wall, the foundation, then successive lines of stone. He says in Ephesians 2, 19 through 20, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Right? There is an acknowledgement that all of the church is built on the shoulders of giants. We are standing on the shoulders of giants. We are continuing a, a legacy that we have learned. And so when we look at the, the, the future of Flint Hills Bible Church, and we look at a generational handoff which will be coming, how people regard their heritage that they have received will shape the direction and the strength and the soundness of the church building in the future. And if people despise their heritage, if they're critical of their heritage, if they think that their heritage is something to be embarrassed of, then be to, to turn away from, then what will the future of the church be? So you look at some of our core values, right? A high view of God, a high view of Scripture, a high view of the gospel. If the next generation rejects those, well, Flint Hills Bible Church will no longer be Flint Hills Bible Church. So how do you ensure that one generation receives the heritage of the other? Well, it's for the second generation to have a humble appreciation for their heritage. They need to have a humble appreciation for their heritage. And this is something we see in Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that you may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now... I am sure, dwells in you as well. 
Now, this is a customary part of Paul's letters. He, he usually has an intro where he states who he is and who the recipient is, and, and then he gives thanks to God for his recipients. In this case, he is thanking God for Timothy, his true child in the faith. And Timothy is someone who inspires a lot of confidence in Paul because he is continuing the legacy. He has a spiritual heritage. And it's interesting how when Paul thanks God for Timothy, he gives thanks while alluding to three different sources of our heritage. And I thought this was really instructive for us is to have a humble appreciation of our heritage. You give thanks for it. Specifically, you give thanks to God for your ancestral heritage. You thank God for your discipleship heritage. And then you thank God for your, your family heritage. Now, what do I mean by heritage? Well, uh, a heritage is, think about inherit. Inher, heritage. It's what you inherit from the previous generation, right? It's those, those, those teachings, those, those customs, those artifacts, traditions, values that are handed down from the previous generation, where what they taught us, we embrace, and then we pass on to somebody else. And obviously, as we see, there's a variety of sources of heritage from your ancestors, from those, let's say, outside the church or the church at large, people who've mentored you and even your family yourself. All of them shape who you are. You are somebody who is standing on the shoulders of giants. And so how do you regard them? Well, with thankfulness, as we see in this first point, you thank God for your ancestral heritage. Look at verse 3. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience. So note how Paul thanks God for Timothy. And as he thanks God, he thanks the God of his ancestors. He thanks the God of his ancestors. Now, that is kind of a side point. The main point is he thanks God with a clear conscience. And, and conscience is one of those words that's very important to Paul. It, it speaks of our innate sense of, of right and wrong. It's our inner awareness, our, our moral compass. Now, just because you have a moral compass doesn't mean that it's set and calibrated properly. Uh, Paul talks elsewhere about how you can have a weak conscience or a, a strong conscience, you know, where somebody with a weak conscience thinks that what is right is actually wrong. Then there's some people who believe that what is wrong is actually right because their conscience is seared, as in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2. Now the Spirit expressly says, later, in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. You ever known somebody like that, like they lie so often that they don't even know the truth anymore? So, in contrast to a seared conscience is a, is a good conscience, one that's properly calibrated, uh, that gives you the freedom to minister with conviction. And this is something that was very, very, very important to Paul. In fact, he, he opens up one of his defenses of the gospel in Acts 23 with this, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in a good conscience to this day. So he has practiced what he preached. Now, one of the big charges against Paul by all these Jews was that he was teaching a new and novel religion. He was leading a, a sect that was contrary to the clear teachings of, of Scripture, right? And so what's interesting is when he says, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience, he inserts, as did my ancestors, right? He served God just like his ancestors. There is nothing new. There is nothing novel. He opens up other defenses of the gospel with Acts 24, 14. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they, like his opponents call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. He is merely continuing what has been taught to him by his ancestors, by Timothy's ancestors. 
Acts 26, 6, and now I stand here on trial because of the hope in the promise of God made in the hope. All right, I'll say that again. I now stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers. He served the God of his fathers. There's nothing new. They anticipated the Messiah. He identified the Messiah. He is serving God with a clear conscience in a way that's consistent with the teachings and values of his, of his ancestors. Consistent with Moses, Elijah, Noah. It's all there. Now, when we look at, let's say, our faith, I mean, we share the same ancestors. We would add the apostles to that as well. They, through their hard work, actually labored and gave us the scripture. But I think if you were to be honest, we have other ancestors we would include as well. Those saints who helped us to even understand the scriptures. Those who contoured and understood the, the Trinity so that when we look at the Bible, we could see it. Those who understood the penal substitutionary atonement. I mean, there is a legacy of godly men and women who even in our own lives helped us to understand the scriptures and understand truth. Not in the Catholic capital T sense, but, but in the way where there's a recognition that God works through the body of Christ to illumine the scriptures so that we can understand the word of God and, and theology. And that's why like reading Dead Saints is great. Men like J.C. Ryle, Charles Spurgeon, women like Elizabeth Elliot and Amy Carmichael, R.C. Sproul is now a dead saint. He got promoted. Jonathan Edwards and others. Now, when you, when you start talking about many of these dead saints, you know, that same impulse that wants to despise our heritage is often very quick to point out the deficiencies of many of these dead saints. George Whitfield, the man who started the, the Great Awakening who popularize the theology that it's not enough to just be a part of the church. You have to truly be born again and you have to be converted and that just lit a fire of transformation in the colonies. That George Whitfield subtly advocated for the expansion of slavery in Georgia. Martin Luther, who helped bring the gospel back to light and rescued the biblical teaching of justification by faith through grace alone also penned some regrettable anti-Semitic statements. Disturbing. Jonathan Edwards owned slaves. Martin Luther, I'm sorry, John Calvin uh, oversaw the execution of a heretic. And so you learn about that and it might be very easy to just kind of wad them up and just say, to the dustbin with you. They have nothing to teach me because they have sinned. Now, if that's the case, I want to give you three things to think about. If you're to focus on all the failures of your predecessors and point out what they did wrong and they did wrong, what they did wrong, what they did wrong, What's going to happen to your self-conception? I mean, it's self-righteousness, right? If you're busy canceling other people, then who's to say that you are really better than them? Secondly, many people, many of those people had blind spots. And blind spots, by definition, make you blind. And maybe they... They did not confess all known sin before they died. But do you really think that before you die, you're going to confess all known sin? <laughs> that you are going to be somebody who's going to be the exception to the rule, that there's nothing in this culture that gives us blindness, that we tolerate, that we're going to stand before the Lord and go, oh no. And thirdly, we need to remember that the power of the message is the message itself, not necessarily the messenger. God can use a crooked stick to make a straight line. God in his sovereignty can use many of these men and women who had some very obvious flaws to do great works. 
And so what some people will argue is say, well, when we kind of go through the Bible and we look at men like David, David was, was an adulterer and a murderer. Moses was a murderer. Noah was a drunk. Abraham had a penchant for lying. And we can, we can all say all of those men and all of those women had some serious issues. It shows us that there's only one here in the Bible and that's God. There's only one here and that's Jesus Christ. He's the only one that we should ever look to. I mean, you could make that argument but there's a problem with that. If you look at Hebrews 11, the author of Hebrews goes through the Jewish Hall of Fame. These are men and women who were notable for their faith and their trust and their belief in Jesus Christ. And then he ties it all up in Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance to the race that is set before us. I mean, Jesus is a great example, okay? Wonderful example, but if we're just honest, sometimes it can be discouraging. I, I mean, I, I think about Jesus' family, right? And the little brothers that he had and his mother saying, why can't you be more like Jesus, right? It just... Well, yeah. But what, but what Bible characters speak to somebody who has blown it? Who is in desperate need of grace? Who knows what it's like to truly fail? Like Peter, right? Peter knows what it's like to fail. You read the gospel, his failure is like memorialized for all time. Men like David. See, a lot of these men and women, in their failings, it shows us the power of grace and transformation and faith and never giving up. There is value in learning about godly men and women who, just like us, have failed and God still used in wonderful ways. You see, the problem is if you start canceling out all these Bible heroes, you're canceling out grace. And that is contrary to the nature of the gospel. So there is a place for appreciating our heritage as transmitted through our ancestors. And not just our ancestors, right? Those who have gone before us, right? But also through people who had direct inputs into your life. You thank God for your discipleship heritage. Look at verse 3b and 4. As I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. This speaks of a, a real special relationship that, that Paul had with Timothy. Look at verse 2, my true child in the faith. Paul didn't have children, but he had spiritual children. There was a special kinship with Timothy. Timothy was somebody who walked along the road with him. They would sit by the fire and talk about theology and then talk about how to put out fires in the church. He was, a, he was somebody who went with him to Rome and ministered to him while he was in that first imprisonment. I mean, Timothy was someone that when Paul parted from Timothy, the feeling was mutual because the tears were dripping from his face. And we don't know why that was the case. I, I would imagine that when Paul says, I remember your tears, he's probably remembering the last time he saw Timothy when both of them knew that they were going to go their separate ways. And he had, in the, before he had FaceTime or texting or emails or even at the postal service, all you had was your memory. And then when Paul would sit down to pray in the night and in the day, he would thank God for Timothy and he would remember that lasting impression. They had a special relationship. And and one thing, and it explains why he says in, in 2 Timothy 4, 9, do your best to come to me soon. And the reason why is so that he may be filled with joy. There is a delight that Paul has in his disciple. And his disciple, remember, is a bridge to the future. 2 Timothy 2, 2. And what you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. All right, they had a friendship, but, but it wasn't a peer friendship. It was a mentoring friendship. Paul mentored Timothy, and Timothy would mentor other people. Have you ever had somebody do that in your life? 
Uh, I've, been, I've been privileged. I can count many men and spiritual mothers who really encouraged me and slapped me around. I needed both. Uh, one person that comes to mind is, is Jack Hughes. You might know him. He spoke at the Road to Emmaus conference, but I met him in about 25 years ago, 1996. I graduated from college, and in the middle of college, my parents moved to Boise, Idaho, and, and by God's grace, I found Grace Bible Church. Uh, Jack was an associate pastor there, told me about the master seminary where he went, kind of got me started on a trajectory about expository preaching, and and so I went down to seminary, sent out by Grace Bible Church, and during my last uh, year at seminary, he moved down to a church in Burbank, about 10 minutes away from my seminary. And so I showed up there and, and started work along with Jack, helping with evangelism and college ministry, and, and through his advocacy, I got a job as a full-time pastor. I was single at the time, and I remember just showing up there Tuesday night, around 5.15, 5.30, looking haggard and hungry. And Lisa would make me dinner. And in fact, it was so regular that they often just set a place at the table for me. And during those dinners, I listened to family devotions. I'd watch one of the kids get in trouble. I would actually watch the discipline, but I heard the thumping and the screaming in the bathroom when it did happen, right? Made quite an impression. I'd watch him put his kids to bed. Uh, he taught me how to keep a calendar, how to study the word, how, how to preach. And, and his fingerprints are all over my life. And, and I'm thankful for that. Much of what I am, I, I owe to him. Now, what's interesting is I've, I've known other men who were mentored by him. Some are eternally appreciative. But I've also seen some really turn on him. Some really turn on him. They resent him. <laughs> he confronted them, brought up something, and, and there is this visceral anger that they seem to have till this day. Now, why is that the case? Well, when you are taught the word of God, your conscience is informed forever. And when you have to push against it all the time, and you have this conscience that's bothering you, you often blame the person who put that in you. I think another reason is um, they had a pastor crush. They had a pastor crush. Right, you guys ever had a crush before? When you have a crush, the person can do no wrong. They are the light of your eyes. You, you think they're wonderful. The whole world revolves around you. Your happiness, when they're happy with you or they acknowledge you, right, especially if they don't know you have a crush on them yet, it makes your day. And often with a pastor crush, it can lead to some relational idolatry where you want more than anything the approval of this person who seems to mean so much to you. Yeah, there's Jesus, but then there's your pastor crush. The pastor, he lets you down. He's no longer what you thought he was. Or let's say he sins against you, says something harsh to you. You are uniquely devastated by that. And you begin to turn, and you begin to question the person who gave you the heritage as well as the heritage itself. There's no grace for them, no appreciation. This is why Brett Laird, a good friend of mine, he says when he gets a backup preacher, he wants to get somebody who's a lot better than him so that people don't idolize him. But he also likes to get people who are a little bit worse than him so they don't despise him, right? He's trying to find a happy medium. But there is a place to appreciating what he has done. Now, do I know Jack Hughes' faults? I do. But he's still on the balance as a worthier man than I am. You see, I can look through my life and I can think, you know what? I, learned, I got the best from this campus ministry and from the people who discipled me there. I got the best from Jack. I got, I got the best from my seminary. I got the best from many godly men that the Lord has placed in my life. See, there's only one perfect discipler, right? That's Jesus. But since he's not physically here right now, the discipleship is diffused among many people. 
And sometimes, you know what, maybe your discipler didn't get it all right. Uh, I've seen many people who, let's say, they've discovered the glories of the sovereignty of God and salvation, and they can be almost angry at former disciples or mentors or pastors and, and just say, why didn't they ever teach me these things? And despise them for what they're not instead of appreciating them for what they are. You see, if they pass on the heritage of the gospel, even though they might not have gotten every single thing right, you can still give glory to God for what they did. You're still standing on the shoulders of, of giants. And if they got everything so wrong, why are you here, right? <laughs> they did everything so poorly. Why are you still here sitting under the teaching? If, if they did everything so wrong, why are you discerning enough to even know where they went wrong, right? There's humble appreciation for the heritage of your former disciples, disciplers. And then thirdly, having a, you need to have a humble appreciation for your familiar heritage, especially those who grew up in the church. Thank God for your familial heritage. Verse 5. I am reminded of your sincere faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Now Paul he is confident that Timothy is going to keep up the heritage which he learned from his grandmother, who's probably listed first because of deference to age, and his mother. They had a faith that dwelt in them, that dwelt in them. It it lives in them. We see this in 1 Timothy 1.14, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. This is not something they just believed and that was it. This belief, this faith dwelled in them and animated them. I mean, what's the difference between a house and a home? A house has, well, it's just a building, but a home has dwellers, right? When a family lives in a house, it becomes a home. In this case, the faith dwelled in Lois and Eunice. They were the real deal. In fact, we read in 2 Timothy 3.15 about how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And the agency by which those came was through Lois and Eunice. They shared the scriptures with him at night. When he brought up problems to them, they would refer to the scriptures. See, when she did the dishes, she'd be singing hymns. It was a godly upbringing, but it was a mixed upbringing. Eunice, as you may remember, was married to an unbelieving father. But nonetheless, through her faithful witness, Timothy was changed. In fact, in thinking this over, I believe that Timothy's example of being raised by a believing mother married to an unbelieving father may have flavored what we read in 1 Corinthians 7, 14. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. He didn't say Timothy, but I imagine he thought about Eunice being that mother who sanctified Timothy. So all this to say, even in an unequally yoked relationship, a parent is able to pass along the heritage of the faith. And incidentally, when you look at God's design for Israel and even the Christian family, there is a, a call to take what you have learned and pass it on to the next generation. In fact, turn with me to Ephesians Chapter 6. Six, one through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, and this is the first commandment with a promise, that you may go, may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. And then it goes on to say, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline 
and the instruction of the Lord. So you see what the father is to do and what parents are to do is they are to take the heritage of the gospel and living in the fear of the Lord and they are to pass it on to their children. And the children need to have a disposition where they are ready to receive it. And that disposition is not only to obey, which is true for children living at home, but to have a disposition of honor. To have a disposition of honor. Now, we live in a day and age where it's very fashionable to rebel against your parents, right? It's just a phase that people you know, go through, is expected as part of adolescence, Uh, It might be easy to just kind of despise your your parents. But the Bible has some very strong words for people who do that. Romans 1, 29 through 30. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil disobedient to parents. 2 Timothy 3, 2, later on in this letter, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. You see, there is a a link between dishonoring God and dishonoring your parents, especially parents in the Lord who are trying to pass on this godly legacy. To despise them is to despise your heritage. In contrast, you are to to honor them. Now, the the Hebrew concept behind this word honor is to make heavy. Some people speculate that somebody who was kind of weighed down with a lot of gold was given more honor. Uh, If you talk to somebody who's honorable, their their words carry more weight, right? And so the idea of honor is to take them seriously, to give them deference, regard, respect, humble appreciation. Leviticus 19, 2 through 3, speak to the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and father. Interesting. See, there's an acknowledgement that honoring your parents is honoring the Lord because the Lord is transmitting his holy heritage to you through their efforts. And when that relationship is broken, when people start despising their parents, they're really despising the Lord who gave you your parents. And I think about all those, those 80s, 90s songs in my childhood, right? Papa Don't Preach. So you got to fight for your right to party. I've never heard the song, but I read about Eminem, I'm Sorry Mama, which is just a vile song where he curses his mother with invective. It's very popular to paint your parents as out of touch. They don't care about you. They're often the villains in, in movies. You go to the family therapist and you walk away realizing that your problems are really your parents' fault, not your own. Your dad was never there for you. That explains why you do what you do. People go to college and they often have a time of, let's say, disillusionment where they start to realize that their parents are just human beings, that they are, they are flawed. And, and these are the people who get really involved in church to become very passionate about the gospel. They want to live their life for the glory of the Lord and they look at their dad and think, you know what? I sure wish my dad was a spiritual leader, but he never was. Or you are passionate about missions and taking the gospel to the world and and you think, my parents just settled for mediocrity. Do you see it? It's real easy to despise them. The world wants you to. Satan wants you to. He wants you to despise the people who are responsible for transmitting your heritage. So how do you how do you deal with this? Well, some of you may have been abused by parents and and they were truly awful to you. 
genuine case of abuse, might have been abandoned. I, I don't know the story. And, and obviously, I don't want to downplay that. That is tragic. And, and that is um, something where if that is you, you talk to somebody about it. Talk to a mature Christian and can help you think through it biblically, okay? But if that is not you, and you are raised just by sinful parents, just like you, how do you get over it? Well, Mark Twain had some advice. He, he said this, When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man learned in seven years. <laughs> you see, it's pretty easy. Like, I was the best parent ever before I had kids. I was an awesome parent. Just ask me. I would tell you exactly what I would not do. I'm never going to yell at my kids. Only pagans do that. God's given me everything I need. I'll never yell, never get mad, never get impatient. But you know, have, having kids of your own, take my word for it, uh, it changes, um, it, it really humbles you. When they're screaming at the top of the lungs at you at Walmart, saying, Daddy, don't hurt me again. Not that this really happened. <laughs> I'm being abused. I mean, you're in a helpless situation, right? Parenting is hard. Parenting is just hard. I don't want to be a martyr. I love my children. Uh, but if my children wanted to write a book about growing up hints, they have lots of material that people who want to find dirt on me can find. They really could. They could. Have I been mean? Yes. Have I lost my temper? You bet. Not ashamed of it, but that's just the reality. And I would hope that my parents, that my children would look at me through the eyes of grace and the lens of grace. right? But if I want them to do that for me, I need to do that for my parents as well. I mean, if you grew up in a Christian home, I mean, and if you are here, be thankful for it. If your parents didn't figure it all out and they worked with the best that they had and if you know enough to critique them, well, the only reason why you know enough to critique them is because you matured to the point where you're standing on their shoulders that you're able to kind of look and see new and improved ways of doing things. If you look at books of parenting available 25 years ago, 30 years ago versus today, there is a glut and a wealth of resources that we have at our disposal. All this to say, you can despise your parents or you can have a humble appreciation for them. What's going to be, what's going to build up your family and your, your church in the future? Being angry? Anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God or being grateful for the sacrifice that they gave. Your mom sacrificed her body for you. They both sacrificed sleep for you. They both sacrificed money for you. They sacrificed sleep when you were a teenager. So why, why despise them? They love you more than you know. Honor them. And that is good training as you learn to honor those people who gave you your heritage it, it trains you to honor those people who went before you, who tried to mentor you, and even honor your ancestors. And as we kind of go, as we look at this church and we want to really build this church and be builders, there's going to come times when you'll, you'll take over a ministry and there'll be some policy or some rule and you're just going to think, what idiot put this here? And you know what? I'm probably the answer to that question. <laughs> Let's just be real. I mean, it's going to be that first generation. When you are building as all hands on deck, sometimes you will choose pragmatism over doctrinal purity. You will make that choice. Sometimes the rule is there because you wanted to please somebody 
and were afraid of what would happen if you crossed them in some way. And so that's why the rule's there, okay? There you go. So you can despise the people who did that, but the reason why the ministry exists is because they built it and they didn't build it perfectly. The reason why you can critique it and know that it's wrong is because through the various ministries, you were educated to the point where you can have that kind of discernment. So yes, they blew it. And yes, they did it wrong the first time. But instead of despising them for what they have done wrong, show humble appreciation and build a better being thankful for what they did. Because ultimately, who was responsible for building this church? It was God using sinful people to build Flint Hills Bible Church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul, Paul he builds on some previous uh, construction analogies by saying this, Do you not know that you are a temple and that God's Spirit dwells within you? When he says you are a temple, he's not talking about you individually. He's talking about all of you. You, plural, you local Corinthian congregation are a temple because the Spirit of God dwells in you. And what does the Spirit of God do when he dwells within a local congregation? Well, fast forward to 1 Corinthians 12, 10 through 11. To another, he's talking about spiritual gifts here. To another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, ability to distinguish between the spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these, okay, all the spiritual gifts, are empowered by the one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So when that local church comes together, the Holy Spirit says, you will get this gift, you will get this gift, you will get this gift, you will get this gift so that you collectively will build the church. There is a mystery between human effort and the Holy Spirit working through us, right? Where he uses flawed individuals to build a beautiful work. See, if you despise the heritage of HBC, you will cancel the heritage of FHBC. But if you show a humble appreciation for it, if you look at the previous generation and instead of saying, okay, boomer, say, thank you, boomer. If you celebrate the victories that they won and feel honored by the stewardship of the heritage that you have received, if you humbly acknowledge that you are standing on the shoulders of giants, you will be the future generation that does not destroy FHBC. You'll be the one who builds FHBC. To build FHBC, we need to have a humble appreciation for our heritage and realize that every last one of us is standing on the shoulders of giants. Let's pray. Well, Father, we come before you just grateful for the men and women who have labored before us, those who are not in this room, previous elders and pastors, previous deacons and saints and servants. And Father, we acknowledge that they have not done everything right, nor have we, but we pray that we will appreciate the good in the heritage that they've given to us. And we pray for this next generation, Lord, that they will look at what we are doing now and that they will be able to see and discern our mistakes and do what we haven't done, uh, do it better. But that there will be a humble appreciation for the work of God that you have done in our midst. Lord, we pray that you will build this church, give us a humble appreciation, help us to acknowledge that we are standing on the shoulders of giants. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand with us once again as we sing together in response, facing a task unfinished.